The Bob Murphy Show, episode 199. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. This is a very good episode because I have Jeff Herbner on, and we're talking about the pure time preference theory, the standard Austrian theory of interest as expounded in the works of Mises and Rothbard, for example. And uh, it was a really good discussion. I thought Jeff was going to come in guns blazing and say why I was wrong. And it turns out we both learned from each other in this very discussion. So this is going to be a good one. And uh, let me just, in this little preface here, tell you guys a little bit about the background, just so you understand the context. So my dissertation was three essays on capital and interest theory. And one of the essays was a critique of the pure time preference theory of interest. So the Austrian theory and in there, besides me just explaining what I thought was wrong with it in general, I also said, Hey, Austrians in particular, you really shouldn't use the pure time preference theory as your theory of interest because it's not Austrian. Like there's many aspects of it that in other contexts, Austrians are aghast at. All right. And so then I went through it. So Jeff and I get, we get into some of the particulars, but that's the background. And then Jeff, I knew had been pushing back against me about this stuff, or I knew he disagreed with me and that he was defending the pure time preference theory, but I had never actually heard exactly what his position was. And then at this most recent Austrian scholars conference that just occurred, so I'm recording this in uh, April, 2021 folks, I heard through the grapevine that Jeff had done a presentation defending the pure time preference theory and that he mentioned my stuff in particular. So I thought, oh, this is great. Let's get Jeff on the show. And, and that's where this is coming from. So without further ado, here is my discussion with Jeff Herbner, who is another senior fellow of the Mises Institute. He's a economics professor at Grove City College, in case you don't know who he is, but he's a one of the standard uh, on the starting squad at Mises University in terms of explaining Austrian economics to the, the incoming crop of fresh recruits who are going to go out there and spread the Austrian vision to the world. So Jeff is a great guy who's a big scholar in the Austrian camp. And so that's why this, I was so much looking forward to this. So here you go. Without further ado, my discussion with Jeff Herbner. Well, Jeff, welcome to the Bob Murphy show. Hey, Bob. Uh, thanks so much for uh, inviting me to your podcast. I, I think it must be the case that we're the only two people in the world talking uh, on a podcast about the finer points of interest theory, right? And not well, some COVID thing, you right. know, when the vaccine's coming and so on. Well, we know the important stuff, so. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> COVID's temporary, but the pure time preference theory is everlasting. So that's it. As, as you know, we discussed, this isn't a debate, even though you and I, I think, you know, have different views on this. So the, I think the purpose of this conversation will be more just so that the general public who has an interest in Austrian economics can understand at least the rough outlines of what the, some of the, some of the issues are. And I do want to stress for the listeners too, what I did is I looked at what, so Jeff, you recently presented at the, um, what's the new name for it? They the uh, Austrian Economics Research Conference. Yes. Yeah. And on this topic. And so for the list, so I have written some critiques of the pure time preference theory, and then Jeff is defending the orthodox position. Is that, is that a fair statement? Uh, it, it is, but okay. I, I must say, though, it, you know, in, in uh, preparing for that presentation, I've, I've uh, recognized the usefulness of your critiques. I mean, they're, it's not that I think that your critiques are all wet or something or vacuous. I think the very important points that you make. And it helped me to understand exactly what what I think a proper response is. Okay, great. Well, great. I appreciate that. And, and right, that's partly because, yeah, obviously, I, I didn't think you would just get up there and say, no, this guy's crazy. And you know, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> I'll, I'll be in the back if you want to talk to Somebody has probably done that, right, though, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, and, I'll, and then what, oh, what I do want to say, though, too, for the listeners is I picked some things that I, th when I looked at 
because Jeff had sent me his notes of, of his presentation and um, up the PowerPoint he used. And so there's some things that are probably more important in terms of like deciding, oh, gee, is the pure time preference theory still, you know, should that still be the Austrian standard canonical theory? But some of the stuff was a bit, I thought like for us to try to explain even the background would be too hard. So I picked mm -hmm. some things. It'll certainly give a flavor of it, but it's not because, oh, these are the most important issues in terms of the overall debate. But I thought this is what would be most conducive for us just talking about it for people who aren't trained economists. Okay, so the first one I wanted to bring up was I claimed that in, in my dissertation, so I had one essay devoted to a critique of the pure time preference theory. And, you know, I wonder, before we even get to that, Jeff, why don't you, since you're the guest and I don't want to hog this, explain to people just that that label. Like, what do they mean, the pure time preference theory of interest? So why don't you go ahead and... Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll take a shot at this. And the way that I've now become uh, started to think about this is precisely in the way that you asked this first question that we, mm -hmm. we were going to use as a jumping off point. This idea that the classification of interest rates are typically in uh, two categories, real interest rates, or what's uh, t what the theorist is attempting to explain is uh, like a Boombob work would, right? The the preference for present goods over future goods. And it's that exchange of goods, the intertemporal exchange of goods that is the interest rate in that theory. And then and then there are monetary theories of interest rates. So Keynes famously posed one and you pose one that isn't, uh, I'm not saying it's Keynesian, but it, right. it relies upon uh, liquidity preference, right? And so trying to explain the monetary uh, uh, interest rate through through liquidity preference uh, as a um, means of dealing with the uncertainty of the future. <laughs> so so those are the two sort of um, typical categorizations. And and I've, I've come to view the pure time preference theory as actually a third category. I think it, I don't think it can easily be categorized as either real or monetary. And so he, what I what I would say about the uh, pure time preference theory is that the pure time preference theory is trying to explain the intertemporal price of money, not of goods. And so it isn't a real theory, but it isn't a monetary theory uh, in, the, in the same sense as your monetary theory is that it is based on liquidity preference. The pure time preference theory is based upon the uh, time preference is understood as the preference for a given satisfaction sooner as opposed to later. And so it's a it's an intertemporal preference for the uh, end uh, of an action to be moved in time closer to the person as opposed to being further away from the person in that given action that they're taking. <clears throat> so so that's the I think the important uh, categorical distinctions between them. So what the, on the other part of this, just to give an explanation of the pure time preference theory, I think the. Um, the best way to do it is to say that it it follows Menger's causal realist structure of explanation, where Menger says that a causal realist explanation begins with the satisfaction of the end, and a person then chooses between different ends uh, that, that compete in in the person's mind for satisfaction, and then once the once the preferred end is chosen. The person then makes a preference choice of the means to use uh, among all the competing means that could be used to attain that end among the means. And so the, the preference of the end is imputed, if you will, to the to the means and then to the lower order goods and then to the higher order goods. Right. So it's this it's this, uh, as Menger says, uh, a, a chain of logic where the very first chain is the preference for the end. Well, not the preference, but the satisfaction of the end itself. And I think the pure time preference theory traces the argument for the interest rate back to the satisfaction uh, itself and not to the goods, uh, unlike the real theories. I'm not saying this involves your theory, but unlike uh, Boombob work, who, who <laughs> he, he makes a claim about time preference being the, the preference for present goods over future goods. He starts there and then he tries to get he tries to ground that in his three reasons. And I think uh, I think Menger would object to this, I think, or at least I would object to this as being outside Menger's causal realist theory. I think what Bumbavrik has done with his three reasons is try to ground the preference for 
the goods in both psychological and technical factors. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I think in, in doing this, he is. And, and by the way, I would say also in reading Boom um, uh, a Positive Theory of Capital, again, for that presentation that I gave, I, I since I was attuned to this, I, I more carefully grasped the fact that he even says when he's developing his marginal pairs analysis of the price of goods, that sometimes it's necessary for the theorists to go, to, as he puts it, to transgress the boundaries of economic theory into psychology to give a an adequate explanation. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what he's actually done in um, in um, in providing his agio theory. Oh yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, okay, so that's good, and you've anticipated a little bit some of what we're going to get into. Let let me just state like the historical progression very briefly in the, in the terms of like the Austrian tradition and, and see if you agree with, with that. So sure. Bumbavirk had this catalog, this taxonomy of all the explanations for interest that had been offered up to the point when he was writing and he critiqued them all, you know, saying that, you know, some were better than others, but and he, you know, classified them and then critiqued them all. And then he offered his own explanation. And so one of his critiques was of what he called the naive productivity theory and uh, we'll get into that in a little bit, so I, I won't like spend a minute explain what that was. And then, um, and he and he famously said that the nub and kernel of his own explanation, what he called the AGO theory, was that present goods are preferred to future goods of like kind and quality or something like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then Frank Fetter comes along and says, Bumbavrik was a great pioneer and he showed us all the fallacies of the productivity approach. And, and by the way, the mainstream had sort of taken a, you know, Irving Fisher's approach where it said, Oh, the, the market rate of interest, the equilibrium interest rate is determined by the interaction of both um, technological facts, like our ability to physically turn goods today into more goods in the future. And then the subjective element in terms of our schedules of time preference you know, how impatient are we, that, that sort of thing. How many future apples would you need to be promised to give up present apples today? And it's the interaction of those two things that on the margin determines what's the equilibrium rate at which apples today sell or trade on the market for claims to apples down the road. And if that's a positive number, then that's a positive real rate of interest measured in apples, let's say. And so Fetter was objecting to that and saying, no, I'm offering a... a I don't know if he used the term. Well, he called it what he. Oh, shoot! What did Fetter call it? Capitalization theory. Yeah, that's but right. But it would. It was a pure time preference theory in the sense what Fetter was saying is no physical productivity has nothing to do with this. As Bumbavrik showed us, that's mm. already included. Like like the fact that a tractor allows you to produce more wheat doesn't explain why a capitalist investing in farms or even in tractors earns a positive rate of return on his investment because the price of the tractor already reflects its productivity. So this is like a, a category of mistake, like the dimensions are wrong. And, and so, and Fetter was kind of surprised, like it's ironic that Bumbavrk himself comes back. And then, and then Mises comes along and likes Fetter's theory and basically just gives it an a priori foundation because Fetter kind of like could said, well, we could imagine a possible world where interest rates were negative. And Mises is like, no, because time preference a priori has to be positive just by the nature of, you know, wanting, of want satisfaction. So is that, are you okay with my summary there? Yeah, I, I think that that's, uh, that's correct as far as it goes. As you suggested, when we get to this uh, issue of whether Fetter and Mises were, as you put it, unfairly accusing Bumbav work mm-hmm. of falling prey to this critique of na- naive productivity, um, I think there's more to be said. Oh, sure, uh, and we will. Uh, y- y- right. So, <laughs> but but I think yeah, you're. I, okay. I think the other thing that I, w- I will interject here about Fetter is that Fetter was decisively um, insistent on saying that interest is always in monetary terms. Mm-hmm. He's, he's pretty emphatic about that, and so he he's decidedly against Bumbavork's conception of interest as present goods trading for future goods. I mean, it doesn't make a big deal of that, right, but right. Fetter's positive theory is always mm-hmm. an interest. He's uh, of interest is always in money terms. Okay. Okay. Y- yes, I guess. Yep. Um, and then uh, also, by the way, also, mm-hmm. I should also add Bob, yeah. just for clarity that, uh, as you, as you put your finger on, it's not at all clear in Mises, in Mises, just as you read 
his text. It's not at all clear that he is is doing that right it's not he talks about present goods trading for future mm-hmm. goods or at least the preference for present goods over future goods and so it's, it's i think much more difficult to grasp mises's theory from what he's written say in human action it's just mm-hmm. uh it's not nearly as straightforward as as fetter now as you right. pointed out the big advance of mises so to speak in in that line is um is his grounding of time preference uh, as an apodictic feature of human mm-hmm. action where, where Fetter had, the, as you say, had this more psychological. Yeah, he just thought it was empirically true. Notion. Yeah, the empirical case, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, but again, for the that I'm stressed that the to call it a pure time preference theory, the, re, the what that word pure is doing is saying it's it's about time preference. It's not about productivity. Whereas a more mainstream approach is, oh, it's the interaction of both. They might think they're saying, oh, it's like supply and demand or something. That whereas yeah. the okay. Um, all right, so then, yeah, so the, the first issue, and, and I agreed that we, we should link it up, is this is, is it a real theory, a monetary theory, or a, what, you're this term you've, did you invent it, calling like a calculation theory of interest? <laughs> I don't, I hate to think that I did, but I guess so. Okay, I mean, okay. I, I can't think of a, Yeah. we need to come up with a better right, term. Right. It's not Wait, a Well, really... it's just as a complete tangent, I don't want to s- totally take us off track, but I found that trouble with classifying Bitcoin. Because oh. in terms of Mises, you know, taxonomy, I thought, well, it's certainly not a commodity m- money, or let's say right. it's money, that quibble over whether it's money or not, but suppose it were. It's not a commodity money, and then, but then the issue is, is it fiat or, you know, it, it's certainly not a credit money. Right. And so that, that means it has to be fiat, but yet you don't yeah. want to say that because it's private no. and voluntary, you know what yeah. I mean? And so it's, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So uh, for this one, so here's, my quick take as to why I, in my dissertation, was calling the pure time for reference theory a real theory of interest. And my mm. broader point was, this is ironic. So for the listeners, I was what I was trying to do was not so much say it was wrong, but to say this isn't an Austrian theory, meaning let mm. me show you all the attributes of the pure time preference theory as propounded in canonical Austrian texts like Man, Economy, and State, Human Action, Israel Kirzner stuff as well and show you it's got a lot of features that normally we Austrians don't like when other economists have theories or discussions that you have these attributes. And so one of them was that I claimed the pure time preference theory was a a real theory. And so it focused on real goods rather than money. And I thought that's assuming for the moment that I'm correct. And I'll, I'll just try to explain why I think that. And then Jeff, you obviously can respond. But my point was, in other contexts, Austrians are really big about, hey, let's not just use simplistic models of like a barter economy and then throw money on as an afterthought. Like Mises was very, you know, he thought that's kind of what opened the door to market socialism and why so many trained economists thought socialism could work because their model didn't have money in it. That what they were trying Mm. to explain was like the real exchange ratios in a Walrasian model and then just threw money prices on us. Oh, and then whatever the money, how much money there is in the velocity of circulation, throw that on to get some absolute price. But the real thing is the real price ratios. And to me, that's what the pure time preference theory is. I mean, famous when mm. clearly said it's about present goods versus future goods, not present dollar. Well, he wouldn't say dollars, whatever, <laughs> marks <laughs> or whatever. Um, and then also, or ounces of gold. And, uh, and then in, also, like, I think a lot of Austrians would say, oh, no, time preference. I mean, it's we could, Robinson Crusoe that, that, that would have, you know, he wants a present coconut more than a future coconut. And, and when Austrians try to motivate time preference, you know, to say the fact that a man, you know, if we didn't, if time preference didn't exist, then a man would value a pizza in 100 years the same as a pizza today. And that's crazy. That, that kind of stuff. So that's where I'm coming from when I say it to me, whenever you read any Austrian, standard Austrian stuff about time preference and uh, the pure time preference theory of interest, they, they start talking about real goods or as you might say, the utility, but they're not talking about the valuation of money today versus tomorrow. Whereas to me, prima mm-hmm. facie, what interest is, is it the higher exchange rate of present money versus future money? And so, mm-hmm. and, and then the last thing I'll mention is if we were trying to explain market interest rates with the pure time preference theory and, and by uh, citing time preference, if you had to pick between, is that going to explain the real rate of interest, meaning like price inflation adjusted or the nominal interest rate? To me, it's clear it would have to be the real interest rate because, mm. you know, if, if they're just debasing the currency and nominal interest rates are super high, that doesn't mean mm. time preferences 
necessarily that high. It's just because, oh yeah, that's because uh, because it's what we're trying to explain is the real interest rate, if anything. Okay, so I'll stop there. Yeah. That's that's where I'm coming from when I classified it is a real theory of interest. And and, and just to follow up on that, I I agree with all that criticism. Mm-hmm. I agree that if if what the pure time preference theory is uh, doing is trying to explain real interest rates in the in the path of Bumbab work, then then it has all the problems you mentioned. I I don't have any quibble about any of that. I just don't think that it's necessary to think of it that way. I think both, uh, well, even going back to Turgot, perhaps, uh, but certainly in Federer, we get a monetary only, <laughs> mm-hmm. you, you know, pure time preference theory. And I think that's an improvement and, and, and your criticisms are uh, on the mark on that point. Okay. So is, is this the, what I'm going to say now, correct, that you're saying you're right, Bob, what Bombaver gave us was a real theory of interest mm-hmm. and that all the critiques I brought up about a real theory of interest, and especially being non-Austrian are, cr- are true, but that's why it went through the sieve or the filter of Fetter and he got rid of that stuff and what he retained, you know, that what was good in the Bombaver you know, approach mm-hmm. and what was passed down to Mises and Rothbard was not, they got rid of that stuff that actually it's not a real theory of interest anymore. Is that well, what you're saying? I, I'd like to think that. I'm not sure it's, I, I'm not sure, as I said before, in, if you just read the text of Mises and Rothbard, mm-hmm. trying to point to places where they talk about present goods trading or the preference for present goods over future, you can find plenty of references to that. Mm-hmm. And so it's not, I don't know if in their own minds they they thought as clearly as they should about, oh, okay. about those. I, I'm just not. I don't know how exactly how to interpret that. Okay, so, so I, I'm not claiming that that Mises himself w- was accepted Fetter's money only uh, position. I, I I don't. I'm not sure I could demonstrate that, so to speak. Oh, but I do think. Okay. But I do think that there. But as you said, I do think these two these two elements are coming together. That the element of Fetter's monetary only or money theory, however you want to say this. And and Mises's apodictic time preference are coming together in an imp- that that this is an advance when they come together, mm-hmm. and you see them coming together. I, I I don't know. You know, is there an author where they where this is obviously the case? In, in you know beyond Mises, I'm not sure. Looks like it's going to be Her- even in Rothbard. You can find. It looks like it's going to be in Herbner 2021. I don't know <laughs> about that. Well, well, I, you know, maybe I'll say something about this. Uh-huh. I mean, that's my position anyway. Right. So I don't know if that you know we'll see if that turns out. Okay. To be the okay. Right so this thing. is interesting. Just. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you're open to the idea that actually a a modern Austrian theory of interest that is consistent with Mises and Rothbard, but yet is clearer, actually in many respects might line up better with Fetter's writings on this rather than what Mises and Rothbard did? Are you, is that what you're saying? Um, I think, I think I, my claim is a little more modest than that. I think okay. what I'm saying just is that I can see how someone would read Mises and Rothbard and not be able to definitively tell whether or not they were a real theorist or a monetary theorist. I don't think you can do that with Fetter. Mm-hmm. I think when you read Fetter, it's it's crystal clear that he is not a real theorist, that he is only talking about interest as the money, inter- the nominal money mm-hmm. interest rate. Okay. And, and I think that's an improvement. I think that's the – if the pure time preference theory is going to be um, um, de- developed in a way that's acceptable, I think that's the path. Okay. I, I don't think – I agree with you that I don't think it can be I, – I don't think you can fashion it as a real th- real interest rate theory. Okay. I think all the, all the problems that you pointed mm-hmm. out – well, okay, we could quibble about maybe a few things, but right. I, I, think you're, I think you put your finger on a very important issue in the development of, mm-hmm. of interest rate theory. Okay. Okay. So why don't I give you a chance then now that mm-hmm. the listeners have a better idea what we're talking, the terrain, let's say you're saying, if I took you correctly that, you know, but it's a bit awkward to have to say it's either a real theory or a monetary theory. And mm-hmm. you prefer to call it a, a calculation theory of interest. So yeah. Why don't you and, explain again what you mean now that the listeners have more background. Okay. And, and I, and I, you're going to take this from Federer where, um, he, he very clearly says that, uh, money 
if we don't have money, we don't have a common unit of expressing the value of things. But when we have this common unit of value of expressing our values, everything is a preference for and against money, then we can engage in economic calculation. So he's got that piece of Mises's calculation argument. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then he says, it, it, it's only when we have these monetary exchanges that the interest rate contract can emerge. And by this, I think what he means, you know, that, uh, that could be taken in different ways. And mm-hmm. what I think he means by that is once we have the trade of present money for future money, the, we can have an intertemporal price of money, which reflects the underlying intertemporal subjective preference, the, the time preference that people have for sooner satisfaction over later. And, and if we don't have that, if we don't have mon- uh, monetary exchange, we just have trade of goods. Then, as you've shown, you, you know, in your uh, in your chapter on uh, this, the uh, trade of goods for goods intertemporally will always give us various rates of return. Mm-hmm. And so and so the we don't have anything like a uh, a, a single expression uh, that's based uh, without these relative changes in the prices of goods. It's based just upon the intertemporal preference of. Uh, that's traceable back to uh, what he would call time discount. Mm-hmm. So, so I think that's the, I think that's what, that's why to call this a economic calculation a view of interest, because what Federer is saying is that because money provides the unit of economic calculation, it would do this across all tradable things, persons, goods, places, and times. And, and so we, it is the common unit in which present valuations and future valuations can be expressed mm-hmm. in, in the same way that they are across persons and places and goods. So th- that's the only reason why I thought mm-hmm. maybe, it, you know, is it kind of a first statement to make a distinction right, between right. his view and the others to call it a, a ca- an economic calculation theory? Well, wow, that's really interesting. I don't remember that being in. I mean, obviously, I read a ton of Fetter back then when I was doing this stuff, but I, since I was so attuned just to the, you know, Mm -hmm. him versus Bombavik and then Mises citing him and whatever that, okay. Yeah. I'll have to go back and and look at that stuff again. So I, go ahead. By the way, sorry, Bob. (laughs) It's it's the same thing. I had the same kind of reaction with with Mises Mm -hmm. until I read your dissertation. It never really struck me that he was saying, you know, preference for present goods over future goods. It it never struck me that that was, Mm -hmm. that meant anything except, except what he defines as time preference, but obviously it could. And, mm-hmm. and it, it represents at least a confusion in rhetoric. If, mm-hmm. if, I, I, I just hesitate to think that Mises was confused mentally about this, but right. But I don't know. I mean, it, it just, uh, it's not helpful for us who come after him to sure. grasp what he's actually arguing. Okay. Well, let me stop then. Cause it's, I want to make sure I'm fully getting some might, some people who are tuning in waiting for you to smack me down and like, no, no, defend. They might be concerned that are you <laughs> are you are you saying that if someone wants to explain interest, are you still okay? But if somebody says, you know, hey, hey, you Austrian economist, how do you guys explain interest? And the person says, interest is it's essentially about time preference. Mm-hmm. Are you okay with that? Yes. So far with that. Yes. yes what yes. if they say, and this is, well, what does that mean? He goes, time preference. Well, because you prefer present goods to future goods, right? That's what time preference is. Are you saying <laughs> that's a problem already or is it still okay? Yeah, that's a problem already. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, I'm going to say you're getting a little heretical. I'm just. That, that, <laughs> I know. I, know. Okay. I, I totally agree that this is, uh, it, it's a thicket. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it, it's a, it's a semantic thicket. And, um, and I think it's only uh, the the brush is only cleared away in Fetter, mm-hmm. where he never, to my knowledge, he never uses these phrases pre- that time preferences present goods, mm-hmm. preference for present goods over future goods. He, it's always it's always traceable back to what he calls time discount. He doesn't mm-hmm. use the phrase no, yeah, time yeah. preference. Right. And this is just this is just the discount of the discount that's applied mm-hmm. to the difference between sooner and later satisfaction. Now, again, I'm kind of, I'm kind of combining the right, right. terms of Mises and Fetter, right. but, but I think, I think that's the way to go. Well, right? yeah, it even happened in our discussion about 15 minutes ago when I was trying to explain the evolution and it would have been convenient in the story I was telling the narrative I want to get is to say, and then Fetter had what he called a pure time preference theory. And I caught myself, I said, well, what he, 
No, he actually called it a capitalization theory, but the important yeah. thing, you know, and I just kind of <laughs> glossed over that, but no, he, he didn't yeah. call it a pure timer. He called it a capitalization, which yeah. suggests coming up with present money values for something, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, that in terms of like standard accounting, what does it mean to capitalize a long lived asset? That's what it means. You, right. you figure out what revenues it's going to throw off going for. I'm, I'm explaining for the listener, Jeff, not, not to you. <laughs> to, to capitalize an asset, you like figure out how many, you know, what's the net income it's going to generate for me over a time horizon. And then I d bring those back into present dollar terms using whatever the appropriate discount rates are for the various future revenues or net income. And that's how you come up with the present market value. Like how much should I be willing to pay for this tractor, you know, given what it's going to do for me over time. And so, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. That that was built right into the very name that Fetter gave to his approach. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing to mention, since we're on Fetter and we've introduced these terms, is that Fetter, Fetter had two terms for the concept of valuing things with respect to time. And time discount, we've already explained. And then he used the phrase time value to refer to what Bumbavork would be referring to when he talks about uh, present good for future goods. Mm -hmm. And so, right, the, the intertemporal trade of apples could give you one rate of return and the intertemporal mm -hmm. right. banana trade would give you a different rate of return and so on. He, he calls all of the factors that would enter into valuing something in, in one moment and another moment or, or lending or, you know, making an intertemporal trade, everything that could possibly affect the valuation of those things across time is included in the term he called time value. Mm -hmm. And so he thought that time time discount the, the interest rate is the time discount and not the time value of things and this time discount can be extracted from time value in the intertemporal trade of money but never in goods okay yes yeah and one way of illustrating that is um so like what i would point out to people is i can show you a barter economy and give you all of the equilibrium exchange ratios where like people have, you know, present apples for present oranges trading a certain rate, that's fine. And then present apples trading for claims on future apples or future oranges. And I can give you all those ratios and let, you know, they can, there's, there's no arbitrage. And yet you can look at that and I can say, what's the real rate of interest in this economy? And it's, it's, you can't tell. You can all you have to would you have to specify a numeraire is the way like a mainstream economist would do it and say, oh, well, if you want to have a basket of consumption goods that we're going to call, you know, like to measure the price level, if you will, or something like that, then you can do it. But that's kind of arbitrary because you, know, you said like the own rate of interest on apples might be positive and the own rate on oranges might be negative. Like what if there's going to be a frost next year in Florida or something, you know, that there's no reason that couldn't or it would be the other way around. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, that that's, uh, that's the way that that can work. Um, and so, like you say, that's why it's, so it is very analogous to the socialist calculation issue that you can have all these disparate things and technological facts and know that, oh yeah, these inputs turn into these outputs and whatever, but without being able to convert everything against money and have some one good standing on one side of every exchange, you know, Mises, at least that's what Mises claim was. And so my point was with interest that, yeah, if you, if you're just going to abstract away from money and talk about interest and in your head, you're just thinking about, oh, I want to consume more apples today than next year, that kind of stuff that that you run into that problem. Yeah, and I completely agree with all, all of your analysis. And it, and it sounds like you're saying Fetter already talked about that, and I somehow missed that because I was focused on something else. I, I think it's just, it's hard to, it's like you said before, when you read uh, an author and you, for a particular purpose of mm -hmm. doing your own research, you, right. you tend to gloss over things that right. maybe on a different reading for a different purpose, you'd notice. At least that happens to me. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the epiphany I had when I was reading Bombavik originally. And I guess, mm. yeah, I guess now we can get into that, this issue of whether Mises in particular was unfair to Bombavik in his discussion of human action. Because yeah, when I was first reading Bombavik, I was seeing like, Oh yeah, he blows up the productivity theory over here, and then here he's bringing back productivity. What an idiot! And <laughs> which was kind of weird because Bombaver, you can read him. You're like, this guy's not an idiot, and he yeah, has a right. good, he has a good memory. It's not like he forgot yeah. what he said uh, in the previous book. So, <laughs> it, it, but it was the same thing. That it took me a minute, or not a minute, but it was only <laughs> after a while that it like it occurred to me. Like, wait a minute, I'm not sure that th this is this is what you know the way to be reading this. But I went in there assuming I was going to see something, and it, it took a while to snap out of that. Okay, so. Let me summarize for the listener and then I'll, I'll say quickly why I think it's unfair. Then I'll let you respond. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, as we said already, Bumbavik, when he's critiquing all these different theories of interest, one of them he called the naive productivity theory. And I can just very quickly summarize. So the idea is, oh, uh, the reason that capitalists can earn an income from interest is because capital is productive. And then specifically, oh, because look, at uh, I can uh, buy a, tr put a certain amount, ounce, 100 ounces of gold into a tractor or 10 ounces of gold into a tractor. And then that increases the, the harvest. And then I sell all that stuff. And because of the extra wheat that I sell, I end up getting 11 ounces. And so that's where I earn the 10% rate of return. And Bambarik is saying that, no, there's, there's a category of mistake there because the, the the reason the capitalist is able to earn interest income is that the price he paid for that tractor was lower than what everybody assumed the tractor would yield in additional revenues over time. Because if it were exactly equal, then you would just break even. You would just recoup your initial investment in the tractor and you'd earn a 0% rate of return. And so what you're trying to explain as the interest theorist is why capital goods for some reason seem undervalued compared to what they're going to yield over time. Why do you have to pay less right now than the sum of the extra revenues they're going to give you, give you? And so he was saying to just say capital is productive. Not only is that wrong, if anything, that goes the wrong way. Like, no, you, you almost want to come up with something. What's wrong with this capital? Why did I, why was the price lower? So that's, that's the idea. So, so he called that the naive productivity theory saying it's very naive just to say, Oh, cause capital is productive. You can produce more with capital than without. That's why, there's a positive interest income or that's why interest rates are positive. And Bavarga is saying, that's a terrible explanation. That doesn't get anywhere. Okay. So then, but then Bavarga later, when he was explaining his own theory of interest said, it's fundamentally present goods are preferred to future goods. And then he gave three reasons for why that should be. The first two, the first one was like, well, just different provision of what, if we're going to have more goods in the future, then just the margin utility will be lower. And so for that reason, obviously, you'd rather have them now than down the road when you're going to be wealthier. A second reason, which is like a psychological thing, just we tend to systematically undervalue future wants. And then the third one, the infamous one was roundabout processes empirically are more productive. And so I, I won't get into what, what he meant by that, but just the idea that if, if you're trying to get water from the stream into your hut, if you just use your bare hands, that's a very direct short method, but per hour of labor, that's not many gallons of water you can get into your hut. Whereas if you take the time to dig a trench and so forth and do all this stuff, then measured in terms of how many gallons of water can you get per hour of your labor input, it's huge, but it takes a long time. So he's just basically showing why is it that there's an advantage to first making capital goods rather than just directly attacking the problem. And so he's saying, if you once you realize that empirical fact, it shows you why. If what you know, I have a resource. Do I want it now or five years from now? Well, no, because the sooner I get it, I can invest it in a longer process. All right. So that's what he said. And so Feder and Mises to then say Bombavik relapsed the naive productivity theory. My, I was just saying, no, because that it was it wasn't naive. The naive just meant oh, you produce more with than without. And what he was saying was very sophisticated. And he, it was working through his ultimate explanation to explain why is it the present goods are more valuable than future goods. This is one reason. And if you took that away, if empirically you couldn't get more water per hour of your labor by digging a trench than just cupping your hands, then interest rates would empirically be lower than they are right now. Okay, so I talked a lot. I'll stop. Mm -hmm. I'll let you respond to that. Yeah. Yeah, My again, I, I had to rethink this when I when I was just mulling over in my mind, uh, you know, what you had said in criticism here. And I come to the conclusion that actually the Feder and Mises and Mumbabrak are just talking past each other. Mm -hmm. I think they're talking about a different conception of interest. Mm -hmm. And that's really the reason why they, they, they never seem to come to any kind of resolute. I mean, the, the whole profession, the Austrian Mm -hmm. Scholars have never come to any kind of resolution to this issue, because as we've already spoken about, Mumbabur considers interest uh, what Fetter would say is based upon time value, right? That's sort of fundamentally every factor that can affect the value of goods um, will be a determinant of this uh, intertemporal exchange of goods. So th mm -hmm. that's how 
Boombaber is thinking about this. And so if you think about that, well, then you need some reason why present goods would be systematically valued over future mm-hmm. because, because it isn't obvious that they would be, right? Mm-hmm. And this is where this is where this is why it's so important for him to come up with a third reason, because as you remember, in, um, as he discusses this in uh, Positive Theory of Capital, he says the first reason, it could be the way. It could mm-hmm. be that we're, you know, um, stocked with goods in a different fashion and we have, you know, a preference for present goods over future. But in a different situation, we'd have a preference for future over, over present. And he says the same thing about the second uh, uh, the second reason mm-hmm. it could it could work either to give us positive or negative time preference in his sense mm-hmm. and it even goes on to say that the two of them combined could give us either negative or positive right. but then he says because of the third reason the third reason is always giving us positive time preference and it's almost always sufficient to overcome any negative time preference from the first two mm-hmm. and so it just isn't a practical matter we almost always get positive time preference so it's really crucial as you said uh, th- this third reason is really crucial. And you may remember he also praised uh, John Ray to the hilt, right, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In, in sort of uh, opening his eyes to the importance of that third reason <clears throat> in, in, in his theory, in his yeah. theory. But but Federer and Mises are not talking about that. They're not talking about the intertemporal price of goods. They're talking just about this discount. And so mm-hmm. to to change the – or to apply – Federer and Mises' critique to the example you gave, it doesn't matter what the production process is. Mm-hmm. For any production process, there's a time discount. And the end that's to be attained from that particular production process, the person always prefers, as Mises says, the duration of serviceableness, <laughs> the mm-hmm. good to be produced and in your hands and serving you sooner as opposed to later. Th- that's interest for, for Federer and Mises. And, and so, so Federer and Mises aren't even addressing the the issue that that uh, Boombaber raises, right? Mm-hmm. And then, and then, what, whatever response would come from the other side saying, "Well, you know, Federer and Mises are off base here because they're uh, because look, look, you can look at Boombaber's charts and you can see that he's right about what he right, says. Right. You can you can think of the concept and he, he's obviously correct. Well, but he's talking about a different notion of interest. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the rose in his chart. Yeah. Or not to get too technical with the listeners, but, you know, he's got these longer production processes uh, correlated in time periods with shorter ones, mm-hmm. showing that if you start earlier, you can engage in longer processes, which would generate greater value at each time period. Right. And therefore, it must be preferred always mm-hmm. because they're giving you more value in each time period compared to shorter right. production. It's, 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 I completely agree with this. Kurt, this is correct. Mm-hmm. But I think Federer and Mises would say interest is the is the time discount for the value stream from each row. It's not it doesn't have anything to do with comparing one row to another. It, mm-hmm. Every row would have a time discount. And that's the interest rate. It's the discount of uh, of uh, cupping your hands to get the water <clears throat> relative to how long that production process takes relative to the start of your consumption. Right. And you always prefer the start of the consumption sooner. You always Mm -hmm. prefer a shorter period of production in any given production process or or to put the to put Boombaber's chart the other way to to make it conducive to illustrate Federer and Mises's view. It would be like saying this. I think this is correct anyway. Um, Entrepreneurs can acquire present money. And when they have present money in their hand, either they borrow it or they self-finance. And they, so they've got this present money. They're going to give up to buy inputs. And then with the anticipation of getting uh, you know, a return when they sell the output, they can invest across all these different production processes. It, it's not the end point that's fixed in the, in the chart. It's the starting point. Mm-hmm. If we fix the starting point and say entrepreneurs have, are funded – and now they can invest in any one of these production processes, longer, shorter, intermediate, and so on, all these different goods that are being produced, <clears throat> then interest helps them in intertemporally allocating between shorter and longer production processes by providing the proper discount right now that they should assess those future uh, revenue streams with. Mm-hmm. I, I, think that's, I think that's what Federer and Mises would say about the charts that Boombaffer gives us. Right. They, they, they don't really care about what he's trying to prove, which mm-hmm. he does prove, <laughs> right, which is right. if you have if you start sooner with inputs, you can you can engage in longer, more productive production processes and give you more value at each step. 
and therefore always mean a, a, a preference for present goods over future goods. That, that's I don't think that's I don't think that's dispute. I, I wouldn't dispute that. Right. I, again, I don't know what Feder and Mises would say about that, but sure. I, I think what they're talking about is something entirely different. Uh, not entirely yeah, different. Right. It's a different right. aspect of this. Yes, yeah, so I I agree with you that they would. So, folks, let me try. I, I think I can give the gist. What Jeff is talking about is Bumbaver, to, to repeat, he's trying to. So, he first of all just shows, because remember, he had earlier critiqued every other explanation of interest to date. And so he said, now I can show you, suppose for the sake of argument, that present goods do tend to be preferred to future goods of like kind and quality. Then, so it's not like a present hamburger is preferred to a future steak. It's that a present hamburger is preferred to a, a, the future hamburger, that kind of thing. Um, and so if you, if you accept that, then all the other problems he raised go away. In other words, he's showing like the interest is, in, you know, the, the, the fact that the capitalists earn income over time, it's because when they, when you buy the tractor, the, the wheat that it's good, the extra wheat that it's going to yield is only a prospective future good at that point. So if present wheat is more valuable than future wheat, and then it, and it trades at a premium on the market, like present bushels of wheat have a higher market value than claims to the same type of future bushels of wheat not delivered until one, two, three years down the road, then a, a tractor that right now costs the equivalent of whatever, 100 units of wheat is expected to yield more than 100 total units over time because those are future units of wheat, right? So I'm just ex explaining everybody. That's why if present goods are preferred to future goods, you can explain everything. But now the question is, okay, but why should that be the case? And then Mabar trying to explain that. And the first two, as Jeff has reminded us, theoretically could go either way. That, yeah, in general, if provision goes up in the future, you tend to prefer it on the, but yeah, there could, there could be a frost next year. So maybe then you'd want a future unit of the good. So who knows? And the psychological stuff, yeah, people do seem impatient to use a loose term. But on the other hand, there are some people that are very stoic and maybe they somehow convince themselves that, no, it's better to wait for satisfaction. And maybe they, they're they so strong that way that it goes the other way and they prefer future satisfactions or something if it's just psychological. But then the third thing is that, yes, if it's true that empirically, the longer the production process you have to work with, the more output goods you can get with a given input, then it has to be that you'd rather get those inputs sooner than later. Because you can, it doesn't, you know, whenever you want the output to be delivered, whether it's next week or three years from now, the sooner you get the inputs to be able to work towards that goal, they can necessarily be invested in a longer process. So if longer processes, wisely chosen, are more physically productive, you have more goods whenever you want them. And so his point was, this doesn't involve subjective time preference, just more is better than less. And so how is that not a separate thing? you know, in addition to those other factors. So that was what he was talking about. And yeah, I guess the, the and the modest point being that it, I guess you'd be okay with Jeff to say, it's not that Bumbavrik fell prey to his own critique. Like cause you're right. acknowledging in his own system, he's mm -hmm. not contradicting himself. It's just, no, they're saying that not. system's not really a, it's kind of unwieldy or it's awkward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I completely agree with that. Okay. Um, and then, and then, but your point though, was to say what, what Federer and Mises would probably say is, okay, and so folks, Bumbavrik had like these tables just showing, oh, so if I have a, an input available this year and then he has it in various lengths of production processes, all the options at your disposal, like in year such and such, you could have this much output. In year such and such, you have this much. And so with each subsequent year, if that's the first time when you get the input and then started on that process, like everything just shifts one row or sorry, one column over. And so that's why the present good is always preferred. But you're saying, Jeff, mm -hmm. it, that's not the way Mises and Federer would look at it. They would just say, no, for a given thing, when I get the input, I'm looking at what can this do for me looking forward. And I come up with its present valuation based on what's it going to do for me down the road. The, the most valuable use to which I can deploy it is going to do something down the road. And then not, but to now evaluate that in the present, I have to discount that somehow. Yeah. As you said before, it's the capitalization, mm -hmm. right? For, for any given set of assets or inputs, it's a capitalization, the right. discount of the future revenue stream. So I guess 
what a Bombaverkian would say is that's <laughs> he doesn't have a problem with that. It's just mm. what Bombaverk was trying to explain is that discount itself. Like, why would you be dis- how come sometimes you might discount a two percent or rather than thirty four percent per annum or something? And so that's, I guess that's well, what he would say. I, yeah, I'm, maybe, uh, but but it'd be good again. <laughs> what do you say in he, German? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think though it's a different conception of what interest is. Mm-hmm. That, that that makes them talk past each other, right, right. as yeah. I put it. I mean, yeah, oh yeah, I definitely agree. They're yeah. talking past each other. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next issue we, we had jotted down to discuss. See how are we doing on time here? Okay. Yeah, we're okay at that. Is um again in my laundry list of hey Austrians, are you sure you want to use the pure time preference theory as your go-to explanation because it's not Austrian? And then exhibit whatever L is look at I've got a quote from Mises where he's talking about interest and li- listen to what he says. So I'll, I'll read the quote that Mises says, originary interest is the ratio of the value assigned to want satisfaction in the immediate future and the value assigned to want satisfaction in remote periods of the future. And so just reading the text, prima facie, it looks like he's saying you, you take the value of want satisfaction, you know, very close and very far, and you divide them. It's a ratio of want satisfaction. It looks like he's dividing utilities. So if if utility were cardinal, then this would make total sense. But the Austrians are adamant that it's not. And so my claim was, look, at you see how dangerous the pure time preference theory is. It leads even Mises to talk about dividing utilities because that's, and it's not because he screwed up. It's because I claimed <laughs> that's the kind of theory it is. It's it's saying, oh, the what? Why is, oh, gee, if if it's in if I'm in December and and I and someone says, do you want an ice cream cone now or in the in the summer or, or do you want ice now or six months from now? And I say, give it to me in six months from now. Oh, d- does that mean future ice is preferred to present ice? Well, no, because they're different goods, right? And so you're like, it's the pure time preference it makes you think of utilities now versus down the road, and then you discount them. And so I was concerned that it it might lead you to look at utility as being this cardinal thing. And, the, and, the, and that was my evidence that, see, Mises is literally dividing utilities. Right. So I'll let you respond. Uh, sure. And, and there are a couple of thoughts that, that I have about this. Um, so let me, let me start just by reading the rest of the quote. So where Bob left off, it goes on, Mises goes on, he's talking about the ratio of want satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Then he goes on and he says, it, speaking of originary interest, manifests itself in the market economy in the discount of future goods as against present goods. It is a ratio of commodity prices, not a price in itself. Mm-hmm. So I take Mises then to mean from that that originary interest is hidden, not manifest, but hidden and operative in the mind of the actor in any circumstances except the market economy. It's hidden mm-hmm. and not manifest. But in the market economy, it's manifest in these money. The uh, money ratios, right? Mm-hmm. Commodity, uh, the ratio of commodity prices. So, so, so that's how I would understand the kind of context in which he's saying that original interest is this ratio. As far as the language goes, and by the way, I have the same problem that you do with the with the language. I mean, it, okay. it appears mm-hmm. he's just lapsed into some kind of a, a, a cardinal utility fallacy. Although, you know. That just seems implausible on the face of it, right? Right, right. You know, as we talked about already, you know, mm. with Bumbabur. But, but in any case, I would say then, if we're going to try to grasp the meaning of what he wrote on originary interest without lapsing into this fallacy, he does say this. The, the quote, we have to emphasize what he says in the quote. He says, originary interest is the ratio of the value assigned the value assigned mm-hmm. to want satisfaction, not the want satisfaction, but the value assigned okay. to it. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, if he's, it, okay, we have to make a further interpretation, right? Mm-hmm. We have to give him a, a charitable interpretation here to say, maybe he means by value assigned just the preference rank. Yeah. Well, why not? I mean, mm-hmm. you, you could mean that by value assigned. You could just say, well, the preference, I have a preference for this given satisfaction sooner over, over later, mm-hmm. which would resolve the, the, the problem. I'm not saying I'm, you know, that yeah, that's, no, that's right, but I think I think 
he, he is a, a little bit more careful than just crassly yeah, saying, yeah. you know, subjective value ratio of one subjective value. Yeah, let me, let me just make sure the listener, co- yeah, that's a good, huh, that's good. Okay, so folks, again, the, the smoking gun quotation that I thought <laughs> proved, Mises says, originary interest is the ratio of the value assigned to want satisfaction in the immediate future and the value assigned to want satisfaction in remote periods of the future. So I was claiming, guys, there's no getting around it. He literally just divided values, which clearly in this context means like subjective value. But Jeff is pointing out, well, why did he use those words assigned? Because in my interpretation, he wouldn't, th- those are superfluous. He would just say it's the ratio of the value of want satisfaction in the immediate future versus uh, want satisfaction or the value of it in remote periods. But he said assigned in both places. So yeah, it does look like he's doing something more nuanced at the very least. Yeah, well, I, I would say just uh, as a last point on this, um, I don't think Mises' theory sort of hinges on that, right? If mm-hmm. we expunge that sentence from human action, right? I think we would grasp his theory and we wouldn't have a, we, mm-hmm. this issue wouldn't come up. We should I think probably, this is the only place where he says this, right? Yeah. That I know of. We, we should probably, I don't know, do you want to take a minute to explain? I feel kind of funny like that we're trying to reconcile faith and works or something, looking at the <laughs> New Testament. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, well, no, no, so here, what he's saying is, and yeah, yeah, so I know. Mises can be wrong. We're not saying he's infallible. Absolutely. Absolutely. But he, Eddie, well, what, what are your thoughts on, like, like cause I know sometimes, like when I, when I got into the whole fractional reserve banking stuff more recently, mm-hmm. I spent a lot of time trying to show how, well, no, Mises work cl- clearly in my mind, he thinks, any fiduciary media issue, newly issued causes the boom bust cycle. Like that doesn't, you know, you do with that what you will, but that, and a lot of people go, oh, I don't care. He's just some guy, Mises. And I thought, well, yeah, but we're, we're dealing with the Austrian tradition. That's important to know what, what was his position. So I guess that's what I would say here. I mean, he was certainly a pioneer and taught a whole generation of Austrians what, how to think about interest. And so I think it's worthwhile going through this stuff carefully uh, but yeah, you could be wrong. Is that, do you want to say yeah, more about why do we, why do we spend so much time caring about what Mises thinks? Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. Okay. Um, and then let's see. So then the, the last one I wanted to mention, and certainly we, in the time remaining, if we want to talk about things too, that you, the, you, you, loose sense you want to bring up Jeff, let me very quickly just kind of, so, okay, Murphy, you took pot shots at Mises and whatever. What's your deal? What do you say? And so here's what very loosely I said, why couldn't we just have a theory like this? Um, so I said, yeah, it's a monetary theory. The interest rates, what are they? You know, first and foremost, they're, ex- they're prices of money. Like to say what's the interest rate is 10% means if you borrow $100, you got to pay back 110. Like interest is about money. At the, the first blush, that's what it is. It, you know, it's, um, and why don't we then, so I, th- I thought, well, why don't we look at currencies? And so when we talk about exchange rates in the same time period between like the US dollar and the euro, we wouldn't explain, if there's a premium for dollars versus euros, we wouldn't explain it due to geography preference or proximity preference and say other things equal, you want goods to be closer to you rather than farther away, even though that kind of makes sense. Like, Hey, I can't consume a good if it's not near me. If a good, you know, to say there's no proximity preference would mean a man doesn't prefer to have a good next to him than by Pluto. And that's crazy, right? So I could build up a whole theory of exchange rates based on proximity preference and how you want goods to be closer to you. And that, that'll explain geograph. And that would even explain stuff like why orange prices get higher when you move away from Florida and towards Alaska. That's, ah, see, it's proximity preference at play there. And any counterexample, I would just say, well, other things aren't equal. So I was just trying to show the Austrians have built up this explanation of interest based on time pre- when you don't need that. Just say it's about money because that's what it is. And then, you know, why would present money be preferred to future money? Well, there's lots of reasons I could give you. And what, what does money do? Like just holding money, you know, gives you utility. And you can, yeah, I guess you could call that liquidity. But, I, you know, again, I, I know Keynes had a very particular meaning, so I hesitate to call it that. But the service of holding money, you know, that's, that's what it does for you is just, it's mere possession kind of helps you deal with the uncertainty of the future. And so I said to, to me, that was the starting point and interest rates are just the market outcome of present versus future money, just like 
exchange rates between currencies. Like there's lots of reasons people might like dollars versus euros or whatever. And we can get into the specifics, but I would just talk about subjective preferences and, and go, go from there. So I'll hand it over to you now. Right. So I, uh, the only thing that I would, well, the kind of basic um, question I would have about this, and I mm -hmm. don't know your answer. And so I don't really know how to respond exactly, but it just raises a question in my mind. And uh, the question comes from what we have talked about before in terms of the intertemporal role of interest in economizing the allocation of resources across time. Mm -hmm. So it, it isn't obvious to me that if you expunge time prep, or maybe that's not what you're saying, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. If you say, well, interest, time preference has no role whatsoever in interest, or if, or if you're just saying that the fundamental fundamentally interest comes from money demand and not from time preference. I, I'm not, so maybe you can elaborate on that. Um, but, but in any case, if, if it's fundamentally from holding money in order to deal with uncertainty, I don't see how the resulting interest rate provides a economic calculation way like Fedder would have it of, of discounting future revenue streams intertemporally. That that would be the issue, kind kind of the main issue that I would. I just don't. Maybe right, you have right. an answer to this. I just I'm I'm not sure what yeah, it is. Yeah. So okay. So real quickly, I would just say, just like if you're a business owner, and you're, um, you know, you're buying some of your supplies from the eurozone mm. and from Japan and Malaysia and things, and then you're assembling them in the U.S. and then you're sell then you're selling the finished goods in Mexico. There's three or four currencies you're dealing with. And so to be able to calculate, you need to know what are the exchange rates between those currencies to come up with a you know, common denominator, loosely speaking, to convert all of the same money to be able to say, what are my inputs? What are, you know, how much are my, what are my costs? What are my revenues? That sort of thing. And so likewise, if you're producing something over time, right? So there I did an example of you're producing something through space and then there was different monies that prevail in each region. So now if you're producing something over time, then yeah, I need to know, well, the fact that my inputs cost present dollars and my revenues are expressed in twenty thirty dollars I need to know what's the exchange rate between twenty thirty dollars and present dollars to figure out is this worthwhile process to embark on and and so that so you, so yeah, time preferences involved if what you mean by time preferences, why would how do you value a twenty twenty one dollar versus a twenty thirty dollar? And if you want to call that time preference, like those considerations, I don't have a problem with that. So I guess okay. that's what I would say. Okay. Can I, can I, can I ask a follow-up question? Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's start, start, starting to, I'm starting to grasp it, but I'm, I, I'm not quite there yet. And, and I think this, your answer to this question would help. You, you know, in the, as you put it, the canonical uh, description of market interest rates uh, we find in Mises and Rothbard. They point out that the any market rate we can decompose into these four causes, right? And they would have time preference, mm -hmm. which generates the originary rate, and then there's an uncertain pre, uncertainty premium that is associated with a different investable project. So not what you're talking about, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the general holding right, of money right, against right, right. uncertainty, but the uncertainty premium, we'll call it. Then there's the price premium from the Cantillon effects of monetary changes and the inflation premium, right? So that's the that that's sort of the pure time preference way of mm -hmm. integrating time preference into the, into the other elements that affect mm -hmm. uh, uh, nominal uh, interest rates. So, so is your, if you were to redo this in your theory, would it be that the fundamental thing that, that never goes away is, uh, is the uncertainty, the, the, the value of uh, having a money holding to deal with uncertainty? Is that the sort of fundamental thing and then time preference is one of these auxiliary things or is it not, uh, is that just not the right way to think no, about it? No, it's a great question. And I should probably say I haven't thought about it lately enough. So I, I wouldn't, I would hesitate to say something and then later realize, oh, wait a minute, I should, I shouldn't have said that. Um, I, I guess my main thing is I, I would want it to work through, um, like first and foremost, I would just say, no, flat out, what is the explanation? Why is it that $2021 traded a premium to $2030? It's because people subjectively value the $2021 more. 
just like when we start out and say, why is it that people, why does steak cost more per pound than hamburger meat? Is a you know subjective value theory because people value it more. Now, if you want to ask me why, okay, I can't, and we can't say too much for consumer goods except the well they do. But whereas with like production goods, then you can get more specific. You know what I mean? Like you can explain why is it that you'd pay more for skilled workers hour than an unskilled workers hour, and you, know, you can give more as an economy. So I, that's kind of the approach I would take. And then I would, as I guess, part of it when you just say why do people value money anyway? or at all, if it's not a commodity money, then you get into the, the uncertainty stuff. So I guess that's the sense mm -hmm. in which to me, uncertainty is so fundamental to it is because that's mm -hmm. why we hold money at all. Or even if it's a commodity money, it qua money. Um, so I, I guess that's why it's fundamental. Yeah. I would, I'd probably be okay with saying that, but that's, and, and so then, too, like to me, that's an inbuilt reason. Other things equal, yeah, you would always want present money versus future money just because the services money provides, present money turns into future. You know what I mean? Like you can just hold mm -hmm. it. And then, you know, you can come up with quirky examples. Like, well, what if there's roving gangs that might rob you, but they're not, they're going to go away after six months. Well, then maybe I'd want future money instead of, okay. And, but that's why I'm not committed to this law of time preference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say the other the other thought I had on this question was that um, I think it is I, I do agree with Mises and Rothbard and the kind of standard view that time preference is a as Mises would say categorical requisite of action. Mm -hmm. I do think this is fundamental to human nature in the same way that preference is and right, right. you know scarcity and so on. So mm -hmm. so I you know may, maybe that. Maybe that doesn't imply a role for time preference and interest, or maybe it, maybe the role is this kind of more auxiliary role, mm -hmm. or however you know, you might couch it. I'm not, you know, I haven't thought through the okay. possibilities well, very carefully. Can you, that for the listeners and me too? So what, when you say, yeah, there's a lot in Mises that could either be expunged, or you're not sure it could possibly mislead readers, especially if they're on the heels of reading Mabauer. But you're saying, no, definitely, you still believe in the pure time preference or let's say a pure time preference theory of interest. <laughs> so what what does time preference mean as you use it and you think it still is the store, the the core staple of an Austrian yeah. theory of interest? Yeah, I think it. Uh, I accept Mises's, the way the way we put it on the PowerPoint slides, the notes that I gave you. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the correct way to think of time preference. So... Um, Mises's description of this is that in every action, a person chooses when to start it and when to stop it. Mm -hmm. And so there's a duration of every action that's a choice variable for the person. The person places, in other words, the action in the moment of time or begins it at the moment of time that the person perceives as being most valuable with respect to the timing of the action. Mm -hmm. Once the action starts, though, the person always prefers that the period of production is short, shortened so that the duration of serviceableness of the good begins sooner. That's time preference. That that's okay. how mm -hmm. that that's sort of Mises's definitive, I would say, definitive statement of what time preference is. <clears throat> and if that it, it, if that I think can also then generate a preference for present money over future money in mm. uh, you know in the in the intertemporal trade for money, well, and well, therefore an interest rate, right? Yeah. If you, it looks like we have time. Let me ask one more, if you have time, Jeff, just to follow up. I can see somebody like Walter Block, perhaps, you know, who's written on this. Well, <laughs> what has Walter not written on? That would be the, the shorter way to express it at this point. Um, I could hear him listening to you and be like, yeah, Jeff's right. I, I, I agree. That's what time preference is. And so doesn't it automatically imply that other things equal present goods are preferred to future goods? Like, why are you beating up on Mises? Oh, because I think I think that um, as we've discussed, I think that it only implies that present money is preferred to future money. It doesn't imply that present goods are okay. preferred to future goods. The, the, the oh, time preference in that, yeah, you time and I are very close. I think <laughs> <laughs> time preference in that definition. I, I don't think I, I don't think it does imply that because if if you were to say that, well, mm -hmm. I guess you could you could, could say that, but but then you you're you're mired in this problem of of intertemporal exchange of goods mm -hmm. that you pointed out, and I mm -hmm. I think that there's no reason to to go there. I think that to put it in Fetter's terms, 
Everybody that wants to make, so to speak, a pure intertemporal exchange where they're not mm-hmm. worried about the timing of the value of the goods mm-hmm. will do so in money. Right. They'll okay. do it in money because then they can avoid this other element of mm-hmm. the result that would occur in the future. You know, when uh, when there's the, you know, the permafrost comes and the right, bananas right. are all destroyed. Right, right. Um, because it, as, you, as you also point out, right, the money is – well, as long as it, as long as the thing that's being used as money retains its medium of exchange function, it's durable. Mm-hmm. It's du- it's right. not going to right right. Okay, well, g- great. Yes, yeah. so like I say, you you and I are very much closer than I realized. So this was yeah. interesting. I, sorry, one one more quick. Are you familiar with Guido's? Because his yes. theory is yes. interesting. Like it's a the stuff he's talking about. I don't think is wrong, but to me that that doesn't explain the interest problem. I'm wondering what exactly. You're, no, okay. that's that's my problem with it, too. I don't think it's wrong on the face of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's sort of debatable, maybe, but mm-hmm. I don't think it's obviously wrong. But but I don't see the connection between the interest rate. And, and mm-hmm. if there is an interest rate that's generated by, you know, the, the superior value of the attainment of the end versus the value of the means used to attain the end, I don't see the intertemporal connection. Right, right. Yeah. And you I, know, it, it would be mm-hmm. the same no matter the the the, the length of the right. action, right? Yep, I, yeah, I had the same. Yeah. I think I even asked him that. In the because I interviewed him about it, and obviously this is a biased recollection, but I almost think he was kind of like, yeah, that's good, uh, you know. <laughs> but, uh, uh. So I think I think he at least agrees that yes, if there is a problem with his theory, it's what we just said. So folks, I'll right now you're listening to bobmurphyshow.com slash one ninety nine, and I'll put a link in to my interview with Guido where we talked about some of this stuff. Okay, well Jeff, thanks so much. This was really interesting. I certainly learned a lot. I'm sure the listeners did as well. So thank you for. Your, I guess is is there anywhere if they want to see? Because your talk isn't isn't going to be made public, right? No, it's not. There's no video of it uh, or audio recording mm-hmm. that I know of. But uh, but yeah, thanks for this. This was great. I mean, you really uh, I really learned a lot as well, and in, in going through your material okay. and thinking about it carefully. So are you? And, and, and I. And I agree that we're we're very we're very much closer together in our positions than I realized at the beginning right. when I you know okay. before I delved into it. Well, this is good. I I have to say this. I feel relieved now because now if people were like, yeah, this Bob, he did some crazy stuff in his history. At least I can say, well, Jeff Herbner said it's not totally crazy. So you know, yeah. and, and if you if you're all right, then then it's you know, well, you get a pass. As, as they say, that and fifty cents will get you a <laughs> ticket on the uh, subway, right, in New York. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jeff. Well, th- well, thanks so much. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. Take Thank care, you, Bob. Jeff. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit BobMurphyShow.com.